Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TMA Ask the Expert podcast series. Today's podcast is entitled Building a Multidisciplinary Team for Complex Care After a Diagnosis of ADEM, NMOSD, ON, and TM, including AFM. My name is Gigi DeFibri. The TMA is a nonprofit focused on support, education, and research of rare neuroimmune disorders. You can learn more about us on our website at myelitis.org. This podcast is made possible in part through the generous support of Alexion Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. Alexion Pharmaceuticals is a global biopharmaceutical company focused on serving patients with severe and rare disorders through the innovation, development, and commercialization of life-transforming therapeutic products. Their goal to deliver medical breakthroughs where none currently exist is driven by the knowledge that people's lives depend on their work. This podcast is being recorded and will be made available on the TMA website for download via iTunes. During the call, if you have any additional questions, you can send a message through the chat option available with GoToWebinar. For today's podcast, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Benjamin Greenberg and Dr. Sarah Qureshi. Dr. Benjamin Greenberg received his master's degree in molecular microbiology and immunology from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in Baltimore, Maryland. He attended medical school at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Then he completed an internship in medicine at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois, before going on to his residency in neurology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. He then joined the faculty within the Division of Neuroimmunology at Hopkins and became the co-director of the Transverse Myelitis Center and director of the Encephalitis Center. In January of 2009, he was recruited to the faculty at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center named Deputy Director of the Multiple Sclerosis Program and Director of the new Transverse Myelitis and Neuromyelitis Optica Program. That same year, he established the Pediatric Demyelinating Disease Program at Children's Medical Center, Dallas. Dr. Greenberg is recognized internationally as an expert in rare autoimmune disorders of the central nervous system. He splits his clinical time between seeing both adult and pediatric patients. His research interests are in both the diagnosis and treatment of transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optica, encephalitis, multiple sclerosis, and infections of the nervous system. He's actively involved in developing better ways to diagnose and prognosticate for patients with these disorders. Dr. Sarah Qureshi received a medical degree from King Edward Medical University in Lahore, Pakistan. Following medical school, she completed her internship at Brookdale Hospital Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, before going on to her residency in neurology at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York, New York. After completing her fellowship in neuroimmunology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, she embarked on a career as a neuroimmunologist at Billings Clinic in Montana, where she currently serves as a neurologist. Welcome and thank you both very much for joining us today. Thanks. Um, so just to start, um, Dr. Greenberg, would you mind just giving us an overview of the symptoms that um, are result from a rare neuroimmune disorder and what um, specialties are involved in treating these symptoms? Absolutely. So, Gigi, first I want to say thanks to the uh, Transverse Myelitis Association for, for continuing to host the podcast and uh, the sponsor, Alexion, for making them happen. Um, hopefully uh, these are serving a, a Good need for our community. And as your, your first question recognizes the multitude of issues that our uh, patients will manage, uh, whether their diagnosis is transverse myelitis, uh, neuromyelitis optica, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, there are symptoms and trials and tribulations. The list includes uh, potential weakness of a limb, whether it's an arm or a leg, that can impair functioning, such as that can range from being an annoyance to affecting balance to even being painful. Uh, pain can be neuro muscle tension or musculoskeletal issues. Patients may experience difficulties regulating body temperature, controlling bowel or bladder function, sexual function. In the case of some conditions, there may be cognitive or mood changes. And finally, for some of our patients with ADEM or neuromyelitis optica, we can see changes in vision. And so these conditions uh, can wreak havoc on the body, and no two patients are alike. They will have a different list of symptoms as well as severity of symptoms. Thank you. Um, Dr. Greenberg, 
with that in mind, the number of potential specialists they see may be quite large. Um, they may see neurologists, uh, physiatrists and rehabilitation doctors, urologists, pain management specialists, psychiatrists and psychologists, to name just a few. Thank you very much uh, for that overview. Um, so, uh, Dr. Kreshi, um would you mind just giving a, a brief overview kind of of what you've um, learned, you know, as a trainee, you know, in a big center and then also setting up your own clinic um, in Montana, if you could just give a little bit of information about, you know, what you've learned during this experience about these things. Yes, so I would like to start by thanking TMA and the sponsors for organizing this. And in case you haven't noticed from the introduction, Dr. Greenberg happens to be a mentor of mine and um, um, has continued to be one as I've built up my own uh, practice in Montana. Um, and also, a few of my experiences also come, I started off my journey as when my sister was diagnosed with MS in Pakistan and we sort of first learned how to navigate the healthcare system for ourselves. And then it's very similar, I find, what I do here, uh, that my patients have to deal with uh, those with transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optica, optic neuritis, ADEM. So, so um, usually the, uh, the first thing that patients will experience is they'll have symptoms. Um, they often get bumped around a few places that diagnosis can get missed in the ER, if they're lucky it gets picked on, and usually by the time they get to us, they've received their um, acute treatment, meaning what they need then and there in the coming days or weeks to try and help them recover, not just faster, but more completely. Usually at, in Dallas, Dr. Greenberg often get, hears about the cases and is able to influence what is done then and there. I, as patients may be in time for me to influence what happens then and there. And we have a few things we can do, uh, which are time sensitive after an event of transverse myelitis, optic neuritis, neuromyelitis optica, or ADEM, that kind of influence what happens next. But our, I think, main overview here today is what happens after that. And how, what do patients need? going forward. So usually, to it, it's like Dr. Greenberg said, it's a very broad team. One of my great big concerns coming here, so I trained in Dallas in a big center where we had a urologist, physical therapist, pain clinic, psychiatrist, rehab, ophthalmology, all of that support. And and I've learned, I've pretty much, I was just talking to just minutes ago telling Dr. Greenberg that Pretty much we've been able to build it up here, maybe not as robust as, as we had it in Dallas. So what's very useful for patients, I find, is is either they'll, the biggest hope is in MS centers, some neurologists, because rare neurologic disorders are rare. It's very hard to find people who are familiar with them. The greatest hope is in MS centers that people are aware of these conditions and and the kind of care that's involved. A lot of times I've had patients who've seen somebody, a neurologist or a primary care here who who's gone approach of diagnosis and adios, which those of us who are familiar with this, these conditions know that there is a lot more that can be done and that should be done and can make uh, patient size totally different. So my suggestion would be to try and find that one person in an MS center or or contacting organizations like PMA that can help you find that one person closest to you in the area who can coordinate care for you, navigate the care system for you, with you. So usually it's either a neurologist or in some places I've seen rehab doctors who are also pretty good at it. So, so that person then has the role of working with you, first of all, to analyze your risk of future attacks and having a plan in case of an attack, what do you do? How do we then go about dealing with symptom management? Uh, a lot of times, if, if we're not very familiar with, with um, 
MS or TM or NMO, we take the symptom management part of it very lightly and and we think that what's been done in right away after an attack is all that can be done. So it's very important for patients to know that they have to find the right team who knows that a lot can be done for what they already have. As Dr. Greenberg always says, there's no deadline for recovery or no deadline for getting better. So you have to ha maximize your chances by having a good team. Usually it's going to be a neurologist or a rehab person who navigates it for you and helps you find the urologist, the physical therapist, pain specialist, rehab doctor. And also kind of what I learned, I've been to so many centers in learning and also with my sister, that I've learned it's also you want to have people who are familiar with these conditions who, who also hope is very important and, and lack of hope works. Hope also works. So a team that's hopeful for you, guides you properly and plan for it the bad case scenario, but also lots of hope and they help you navigate it. Because the ultimate goal of all of this is not just to prevent future attacks or to treat your symptoms, it's to help our patients lead a fulfilling life, whatever, enable them to do whatever they want to do. And and a lot of times it, your team can greatly help you with that. And that's where I've found, especially since I moved to Montana, very, I need, I can't do it for my patients alone. It's been very useful to have connections with transverse myelitis association. With their help now, we've started support groups here. A lot of times it's also very useful. That's also underappreciated by people who are not very familiar with these conditions. It's how important it is for patients to have mentors with similar conditions who, who've navigated through life and done, fulfilled their whatever goals. So, so that's been a very important part for me, apart from urologist, physical therapist, pain clinic, all of that. In in Montana, what was really missing, most of my TM patients had never met another person with TM. My NMO patients had never met another person with NMO. So to kind of connect them, and and the one thing we try and do in our support group meetings is control our message so that it's a message of hope and patients are helping each other, uh, and and that's we've gotten enormous feedback on that, that it's made a huge difference. That's I'll let great. you go ahead. <laughs> it was kind of a long answer. I don't know how to make it short. So. No, that was great. Um, and it's great that, you know, the support group is happening now in Montana, um, especially where there, you know, there may be fewer providers and it's, you know, we, all, we often hear of people who've never met others with these disorders. Um, so it's great to have an opportunity to, to have that happen. Um, and so you both talked about how there's, you know, multiple providers working with the patient, um, you know, on various symptoms that may, you know, the, the um, person may have. So one of, one of our questions um, that came in was, when I already have multiple providers working on various aspects of my TM symptoms, bring them together. At the moment, I have a neurologist, psychiatrist, dermatologist, and urologist, plus the primary care. You know, others come and go as necessary. So how can how can this person bring them together um, to get the best care? Yeah, that's that's a challenge. Um, you know, so I'll go from the, the ideal to the reality. So the the ideal is what happens on the inpatient setting or in uh, cancer centers after a new diagnosis of cancer, which is a an event called a multidisciplinary round. So what happens in an inpatient setting, if you're admitted to the hospital with a complicated issue, at some point, a whole team will sit around a table, including a nurse, a social worker, people from different specialists, uh, specialties, and they will come up with the grand plan on how to do things. Or if you've been diagnosed uh, with a tumor, there is something called a tumor board where the radiologist, the surgeon, the oncologist all sit together and they map out an appropriate plan of care as a unified team. So there are some ideal settings in the healthcare system for non-ideal, for obviously serious and upsetting conditions, where, but an ideal approach from team care where communication happens. That does not happen in the outpatient world. There very rarely are there multidisciplinary, simultaneous discussions about an individual's care. An exception to that is in our pediatric center where people come in and they see multiple specialties in one day and we all say, so that, that's rare. 
And so for the normal setting uh, where you go from visit to visit to visit, uh, in general, there is a lack of meaningful communication. And so the, the solution that I recommend or the approach to manage that I recommend to uh, families is one of two or a combination thereof. So number one is there needs to be a quarterback of the medical team, and they need to know that you have designated them as a quarterback. And it can be your primary care physician. It does not have to be the neurologist or the rehab doctor. But whoever it is, you have to look them in the eye and say, listen, Dr. Greenberg, I am seeing a lot of different specialists. I need to make sure I'm coordinating everything through you. Are you okay with that? Is that okay? Meaning, I want them all to send you notes, and then when we meet, I want to distill all the information. So one option is to make sure somebody partners with you to quarterback this and that they know they're the quarterback. The second part, either alternative or in parallel, is to make sure that you are getting the records and the notes from all of the visits and making them available uh, at uh, the other visit. So, for example, when patients come in to see me as a neurologist, there is this assumption in the world that our healthcare system is working seamlessly and their, uh, physio their uh, physiatrist has sent me their most recent notes. It may or may not be the case that they sent them, but it, it's almost always the case that I don't have them right in front of me. Um, our healthcare system is extremely complicated from a data perspective. There is nothing that is easy. And unfortunately, it falls on families and patients to keep their own histories organized. So coming to my clinic with the last set of notes and saying, in case you need them, here's what my last PT visit was, here's what my psychiatrist did last, and developing your own organization makes a big difference. But at a minimum, uh, you need a, a quarterback designated, and they need, need to know they're the quarterback, and patients and families, unfortunately, will have to take some responsibility for coordinating the exchange of information. Okay, great. And Thank I, you. I'll just, I, I'll just make one other comment. In, in situations where complex decisions have to be made, it is absolutely appropriate for families to ask their practitioner to call one another. So if, it, if there is a procedure being discussed or there is a significant change in medical management and you want your neurologist and physiatrist to be on the same page, you can ask, would you mind calling Dr. Greenberg and just making sure you're all on the same page? In general, care providers will not have a problem doing that, but sometimes they need to be nudged to do so. Right. Okay. And then... Um in, you know, we have less of a focus on this, but what, what is the role with a, you know, a general practitioner and how much, to, how much should patients rely on a neurologist or a general practitioner to get to other providers, like a, a urologist, um, and how should they find these different providers? You know, this is especially different potentially in a small town or a rural area. Um, so Dr. Kreshi, if you could just address that. Usually, um if you have a uh, primary care provider or um, who is not very familiar with, a lot of them are not very familiar with TM or NMO or optic neuritis, um, and you might have done more research about it, for instance, on TMA, and now you know what all is available to you. I've found a lot of them, they're not averse to learning more. They're very, very happy when, when uh, they refer patients to me and I send them notes or I, I talk to them, they, they want to learn more. So, so um, a lot of times they, they are open to suggestions. So, so they sh patients do have to advocate for themselves. It's a good idea to do so or your family member and, and learn about the options and, and talk to your primary care provider about it. Um, if you are seeing, not all our patients are seeing um, neurologists or rehab doctors, in my opinion, here they do better if you do at least once a year see somebody who's familiar with your condition and, and they're able to problem solve. 
for instance, a lot of patients don't make the link that their bladder problems are due to the issue in the spinal cord of the brain. So, so definitely if you know that you should be seeing a specialist, I've found primary care providers to be very, very uh, open. They, they want to learn and they, they, they help patients. Um, if, if, uh, but it's also, for that reason, a very good idea to see a primary a neurologist or somebody who sees that condition more commonly because they're able to find things for you that you don't know of. For instance, they can make that connection bladder symptoms and, and uh, your TM could be related. Okay, and then, um, so we, we've got another uh, question um, from, from our audience. Um, so this uh, person is two years out from um, ADEM and still improving. Um, and they've added acupuncture to their care, um, and they're just wondering how they link the person doing the acupuncture into the rest of the care team. It, you know, for them, it feels like another silo. So, is there um, any way to kind of link these alternative treatments also within, um, you know, uh, medical care for patients? Yeah, I, I think the um, all aspects of the healthcare team, whether it's in the uh, you know, I hate using the terms traditional Western sense, that's the, the, the casual way to refer to it, versus you know, holistic or alternative approaches to medicine, which we embrace in our center. Um, all, all of them have to be treated equally. And uh, it is important for uh, an acupuncturist or a dietitian or a naturopath who is providing medical care to document their care and share that documentation with all members of the team. And so I am, would be very um, uh, concerned about any care provider who wasn't willing to do that. So if you are seeing an acupuncturist, they should be keeping a record of the care they're providing, what they're doing, what they're observing, what definitions of success they are using, and they should be providing that communication in written form to uh, whoever the uh, patient and family's care coordinator is going to be. Um, and uh, likewise, they should be kept in the loop. I, I think we need to be breaking down the silos uh, between the varieties of approaches to care. As my patients be naturopaths, I want to know what their what recommendations are being made um, so that we can be on the lookout for anything that would have interactions with medication, or quite frankly, most importantly, if success is being achieved, I would like to know why and how. Uh, I, I think one of the things that um, some physicians get a bad rap about is not embracing a holistic approach to care, uh, to which I respond, it's hard to embrace something that we're kept in the dark about. And so I, I really encourage my patients uh, to encourage any practitioner they're seeing to share with me what they are doing and the success we're seeing. Um, so again, I think it's about the communication, but I would not discriminate based on the practitioner. So again, whether it's an acupuncturist or a chiropractor or, or a masseuse or a physical therapist, uh, we want to be kept in the loop. Thank you. Um, and then we have we have another question um, from one of our members that said you know they were diagnosed with transverse myelitis five years ago, um, and so when they were first diagnosed they were seeing their neurologist pretty frequently, um, but they were just wondering how often they should be seeing a neurologist to manage you know long term care after that sort of acute event. I can... Sarah, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah. So in my experience, and it depends on the case. Um, so in the beginning, obviously, you, you depending on what's going on, you see the person um, more frequently. Most patients, um, and basically you have to have somebody who's advocating for you, watching out for um, what things can benefit you, whether it's your neurologist, primary care, or rehab person. But certainly, a lot of times, most of us do surveillance MRIs and are watch, watching out for um, um, recur signs of recurrence, any, any clue that this is a recurrent condition during those first three to five years. So that's one aspect that we look at, and it's very advisable to follow up with 
a neurologist during that time period. The other aspect is the symptom management side of it. So, so if you, I have patients who who recovered amazingly, and there isn't much that I'm offering them from symptom point of view, symptom control point of view. So once a year for them should be fine. Um, there are other patients who I met five years after their initial TM event, and they still weren't in an ideal place from sacral bladder or 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 um, any spasticity point of view. So so we then started working, and and over time it can be less and less. I help them navigate the system, so you pain and be that one person who coordinates everything as far as I can and when they're in a better place then it's much less frequent that I see them. Uh, it can be once a year if, if you're very well controlled. Beyond five years they may decide not to see the neurologist unless something else happens. In my experience it's a good idea to see them at least once a year. So you keep learning even if you're symptomatically doing very, very well so that you keep in touch and if there's a problem you can call them. Okay, and yeah, and if, and if I can add one sorry. comment to that, um, there's there's also two, I, I agree 100% uh, with what Dr. Kreshi said, and to add to the reason to keep involved with the practitioner over time, there there's um, two, one's mundane and one different. The mundane one is to recognize that most practices have a rule that if a certain amount of time goes by without being seen, you will then be considered a new patient, and there may be a wait to get in and see your clinician. And so you always want to be aware. Some practices will say if you have not been seen in the last two years, you have to go to the back of the line as a new patient. And so if urgent things came up, it may be an issue. So keeping some sort of regular connection can avoid um, obstacles to care in the future. And then the second is uh, research is moving forward on all of these conditions. New drugs are coming down the pipeline. I it, Practitioners don't keep a list of everyone who would be a candidate for future therapy. So if something new comes out, the way we often remember you're a candidate is we see you in the clinic. And so keeping uh, in contact with the clinician in case something new has been developed that you may benefit from is a worthwhile uh, reason to do it. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, at what point should um, a patient get their uh, urologist involved in their care? And is there a specific type of urologist that should be um, involved? So, you know, a general urologist, a neurourologist is, um, you know, any specific kind of information about the type of urologist that should be involved. Dr. Um, Qureshi, also if you don't mind just speaking up a little bit, we've had um, a few comments about it being, it being a little hard to hear. That's a common comment I get. So uh, can you hear me properly now? Yes, thank you. Okay. So um, I would say that it doesn't have to be a neurourologist, but the type of neurologist who is familiar with these conditions. That I've found very, very useful. So when I first moved here, I um, referred to many different neuro urologists, and then I was fortunate enough to find one who's very familiar with these conditions. Just like neurologists are subspecialized, so are urologists. So yes, it would be very, very useful to find somebody who's familiar with neurourology or the impact of these conditions uh, on, on uh, bladder. Um, and the point to see a urologist, so if you are having frequent urinary tract infections, if you're having bothersome urologic symptoms, so urgency, having to go all the time, not enough time to get to the restroom, those are common symptoms, not being able to empty your bladder completely, which puts you at risk of infections. Um, and infections are sometimes considered not that important, but, but a urinary tract infection can turn into a blood infection and sepsis, which can be a very severe condition. So, so any of these bothersome bladder symptoms or frequent urinary tract infections, often the, the urologist can clarify for us 
there are a number of different issues that can happen. TM or NMO, they don't affect the bladder in just one way. You can have a sphincter problem, you can have a couple of different types of bladder issues, and the management of them is different. And it also can be life-changing if you just get other some bladder symptoms or urinary tract infections. So it's definitely worth seeing a urologist if, if you have bladder bothersome bladder symptoms or or uh, infections. Thank you. And then, um, you know, we have another question that where someone sees a urologist for their um, bladder issues, but they weren't sure who to see for um, bowel dysfunction and sexual dysfunction. Dr. Greenberg, would you mind taking that? Yeah, so for uh, sexual function, often it's a urologist, um, uh, especially for, for men. For sexual dysfunction in women, uh, it can be a urologist, a gynecologist, or a, somebody who specializes in both. For bowel dysfunction after a nervous system injury, whether it's, it's usually spinal cord based, but whether it's brain or spinal cord, um, most physiatrists, most rehabilitation doctors have had training in how to manage neurogenic bowels, and there are bowel programs. So often, um, gastroenterologists aren't the place to go for a neurogenic bowel. I have more success with uh, good management and recommendations coming from uh, rehabilitation specialists. Okay, thank you. And then are there any, we had a question about how to involve a physiatrist and, you know, what, what their role is. Other than what you just mentioned, are there other um, places where the physiatrist might come into play, for example, with spasticity or something else? Yeah, so when it comes to physiatry, often they are a jack of all trades because they have, in theory, been schooled in how to manage issues after central nervous system damage. So. Um, Depending on the physiatrist and its practitioner dependent, they may feel very comfortable managing neuropathic pain, spasticity, rehabilitation. Some of them will even manage mood and fatigue. And that becomes more of a practitioner dependent event uh, than the actual specialty because their training uh, entails um, education in all of those issues. So for some of our patients, they receive much more of their year-to-year -year care from physiatrists than neurologists, and there's nothing wrong with that. In general, this is actually might come as a, a scary statement, uh, but it's worth noting, neurologists do not get tr formal training in the management of uh, long-term management of spinal cord injury patients. That, that is not a training neurologists are required to have to be a neurologist. You can uh, go through a top flight residency program and never be involved in the management of a spinal cord injury patient. Um, and so the neurologists that end up specializing in this area often seek out additional training through fellowship to get that exposure. Physiatrists, however, it, it's, it's pretty impossible to get through physiatry training and not have uh, some level, and usually a big degree, of exposure to the management of patients who've had the sequelae of a brain or spinal cord injury. Thank you. Um, and then uh, we had another question um, that this um, person is has a um, sees their um, general practitioner for um, they get antidepressants their prescription from the general practitioner but they were wondering whether that's something that they should really clinical psychologist yeah um, and and I'm curious about Dr. correct she's sorry your your thoughts on this but in general I think it's absolutely appropriate for a primary care provider to be um, the prescriber for an antidepressant or a mood stabilizer. Uh, I think there should be recommendations 
can simultaneously be a counselor, whether they're a licensed counselor or a psychologist who's dependent on multiple factors. If somebody has tried two or more antidepressants or is requiring more than one for management, at least a one-time consultation with a psychiatrist is probably appropriate. But uh, I think these days our family care practitioners and our internal medicine colleagues are getting a fair amount of experience uh, in the world of managing uh, basic antidepressants. I've had this. Okay. And then um, we had another question as well about, um, you know, a lot of uh, people with these disorders uh, need to use a wheelchair or orthotics and whether it's important to get a physician involved in getting that wheelchair, um, different orthotics, and how one should go about doing that. So that I, I can give you my experience here. So I think in Dallas, that's uh, um, something I've now we're be, uh, beginning to get uh, a wheelchair clinic here and a gait clinic here for our patients. Uh, it's very useful to involve. Usually um, in Dallas, that's what I saw, and, and here as well, rehab doctors and physical therapists are very important. And a wheelchair, any wheelchair um, is not okay. Rehab doctor looks at how you're sitting on the wheelchair, any modifications needed, are you getting scoliosis or something. So so it's very important to, to go to a doctor who's familiar usually it's the rehab doctor here as well as a rehab doctor who guides us on that aspect and then also what I had been finding it very difficult to find here is is people who are familiar with not every orthotic devices you can't order them online and that's it you gotta see the patient um, usually it's a physical therapist or orthotist they work together and come up with something that's useful for what they think is going to help that particular patient and then follow them going forward and make adjustments. A lot of times patients can have a very discouraging experience with orthotic devices because they they just get them and then there's no follow-up. If, if it's causing pain or discomfort or, or you're still dragging your leg, there, there can be adjustments that can be made. So it's, it's, that's what we're trying to do here is to set up a gate clinic where you you first go in and, and get evaluated and then they follow up with you until until you it's smooth sailing to and then see you periodically still afterwards to make sure things are going uh, are ideal optimized for you and and going well. It's the same with wheelchair uh, if you positioned badly in your wheelchair it can actually be very harmful. Great, thank you. Um, and then um, we've we had another question um, where someone said that they're you know they're four years past uh, post TM diagnosis, um, and they've never really had any um, PT or post diagnosis care, and just have found um, their spe specialists on their own, and no one really talks to each other. Um, and so they they were just curious, you know, ha you know how they can get these providers. Um, you know, if there's a, a network or something that is available for patients to be able to find um, providers that specialize in TM and other disorders. Yeah, and I, I, I think the best uh, two uh, options we have is one, the Transverse Myelitis Association on their website, www.myelitis.org, has a search function by state for providers who have been identified in some fashion as uh, seeing patients with these disorders. Now, it's important to recognize that uh, there is uh, uh, some review as referrals are made in and practitioners have to agree uh, to have their information listed on the website, but there is not a formal vetting or certification process for those practitioners um, it is, uh, from a, a knowledge base perspective, it's just that they have had exposure and are willing to be part of the network, but it's a good place to start. Um, there is now a, a certification exam that is being offered 
on rare neurologic disorders. Now, so far, we've had less than 10 people go through the exam, uh, but over the next several years, we hope to have more, and that will be a way for people to identify themselves as having passed uh, uh, a standardized test to judge their knowledge about different aspects of managing these conditions. And in the future, we hope that'll be a great resource for identifying practitioners. Um, and then finally, frankly, it's the families, whether it's on Facebook uh, through the TMA, which is probably the best source, um, and uh, putting the word out to say, I live in such and such area, does anybody have a recommendation uh, for a practitioner with expertise. The, the key that I would encourage everyone to remember is the, the, depending on where you are, the background of the specialist who is most uh, prepared and proficient to meet your needs may be different. In some areas, it will be a neurologist. In some areas, it will be a physiatrist. In some areas, it, it may be an internist. And so, um, you have to go in looking for a provider with an expertise, not somebody with a specific credential. Thank you. And just to um, you know, give a little more information, the, there's more information about the uh, certification on the website myelitis.org, and there's also um, Smart Patients, um, which you can sign up for on uh, myelitis.org as well um, to you know, ask others for um, recommendations for providers in their area. Um, so just, um, you know, we're nearing the end of our time, and I was just wondering if there was anything um, that we didn't talk about that either of you think is important to mention um, about this issue. Um, I, I guess what I would say is I, I really want to validate uh, what I think a lot of people feel, which is it is really hard to navigate the healthcare system. It's it's a full time job, and that's even if you have a common condition. Um, when you add on the rarity of these diagnoses, there, there's nothing more deflating than to walk into a practitioner's office, tell them you have neuromyelitis optica, and and have them say, a, a, they've never heard of that, or you watch them Google it, or they ask you how to spell it. Um, and, and that is a, you know, very disheartening experience. And so I, I definitely uh, can appreciate and empathize with just the trials and tribulations that families go through. That said, I, I am also reassured and inspired by what people can do as they coordinate uh, what are at times unusual care teams. It is always more important to have a practitioner who is vested in your care, accessible, and who listens than having somebody with, who is uh, the expert, so to say. And if you get both, that's great, but they're not necessary. So what I tell patients who come to see me from a long way away is all you need is an internist who talk to me. and I. I I will walk them through things. All you need is an insurance willing to talk to Dr. Koreshi. And they, they may have never seen somebody with TM before, but that's okay. As long as they're willing to communicate with centers, you, you can get the care you need. It absolutely takes work uh, from the family. There is nothing that is easy. There is nothing that is handed out. There is nothing that is simple when it comes to our current healthcare system. And, um, uh, the key is to have grit and to keep pushing and to advocate for yourself or your, your family member uh, relative to access to care uh, and recognize that the person you're getting access with does not have to be uh, the neurologist in Billings, Montana or the neurologist in Dallas, Texas. It needs just to be someone who's willing to communicate with those groups. Thanks. I think that's uh, great advice. And Dr. Kreshi, do you have anything else to add as well? So, yes. Um, I think I totally uh, agree with Dr. Greenberg. And I think usually I can also kind of uh, add on as a family member, it's always worth the effort to, or a patient to, to find that one person who's an internist or rehab doctor or neurologist who is willing to listen and then navigate your care with you um, and 
that's very, very important. It may not be the first person you meet. It might be a second or third person that you get to and you finally develop that relationship or feel comfortable with. And TMA website can be um, um, a source for or talking to other patients might be make it easier to find. Also, also um, MS centers or people who, who are familiar with MS tend to have some experience with these disorders. And then here in Montana, what we also deal with is, is first of all, a lot of deficiency of people who are familiar with these conditions, but also the distances involved. So a lot of my patients commonly come from four to five hours away. And what we're, we're hoping to, to uh, develop further here is what Dr. Greenberg just said, is for me to have a little bit of a more a better communication with their primary care provider where because if they have a problem it's easier for them to go to them first and if it's serious enough to come all the way uh, five hours away to see me so hopefully we're going to work on educating these primary care providers who are sitting four to five hours away from me this is very, a common problem here maybe not in, in the rest of the country and also maybe try and use a little bit of telemedicine um, to to make it things make things easier for our patients who live four or five hours away and who are often the ones who also don't have the resources. It's not been uncommon for me. A patient absolutely needs to come and see me. They just don't have the resources at that time to do that. So so it's a lot of challenges, but we're working to make it better. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, and just for everyone um, listening, this podcast it has been recorded and will be made available on our website. Um, and also we will have a podcast again um, next month um, about vaccinations and rare neuroimmune disorders. Thank you both very much.